are the arts essential? A provocative question, but also the title of a fantastic new book, a compilation of 25 essays which seek to answer that question. And specifically, one of those essays is an Urdu of the 21st century of the United States, written by Zeba Rahman and Hussein Rashid, who are joining me today. Zeba and Hussein, welcome. Thank Thanks you. so much, Rajav. Okay, well, first of all, let me just make you guys sound super fancy. Uh, Zeba Rahman is the director uh, for the Building Bridges program at the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Arts. And Hussein Rashid is a scholar of Islam, an academic, and an all-around geek and Star Wars aficionado. The perfect combination to tackle this question if the arts are essential. I love a superhero origin story. And I want to find out how Zeba, this fancy schmancy director from Doris Duke Foundation, teamed up with Hussein, a scholar, to work on this particular essay for this book, Are the Arts Essential? You know, we were just after that introduction, I have to say, I'm glad you introduced uh, Zeba as fancy schmancy and me as a scholar instead of the schlub from Queens, New York. Yes, you yes, know, you're, so you're, the, you're <laughs> the schlub. It's very clear. You are the schlub, my friend, and, and Zeba is the baller. But nonetheless, you, you both have come together uh, for a fantastic essay, which we'll be talking about. And to really answer this question, the question is, are the arts essential? I'm just really curious why you all thought, you know what, we should work on this one together. Since our uh, the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art and the Building Bridges program within it are interested in how to create stories to connect people across cultures, across disciplines, across uh, uh, so many axes that I thought that your interest and your scholarship, the combination of the two were your superpower. And I really, really want to dance closer to that and partner with you in some way and learn from you. So the sneak part of it is that I really wanted to learn from you and I reel you in. I, I have to interject because I cannot tolerate <laughs> this, this vomit-inducing flattery anymore. Uh, just, just both of you just relax. All right, enough. Uh, before we move on to the essay in particular, I have to ask this question and you have to answer it. Zeba, first, uh, you're up. Your favorite superhero? It has to be a comic book superhero. I, I, I am a fan of Superwoman. Okay, uh, Hussein. Over all time, Cyclops from the X-Men or the Summer's Great Clan in general, but at the moment, Miss Marvel, Kamala Khan. Miss Marvel, Cyclops, Super, Supergirl, can't go wrong. Okay, so you're talking about the power of pop culture uh, and specifically comic books and, and the power of art, right, to convey a message. And, and you're, you're one of the 25 contributors to this fantastic book, Are the Arts Essential? The book, and I recommend everyone get it, is divided into five parts. And specifically, your essay is in the uh, third section, which is about finding and fostering community. So you could have picked Miss Marvel, you could have picked comic books, you could have picked Spanish, you could have picked hip hop culture, you could have picked food, uh, you know, salt, fat, everything in between as the cultural vehicle uh, to explain how you can build community. Instead, you picked a 200 year old poem in Urdu by Mir Taki Mir, dealing with loss and a diseased heart. Explain that choice. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, look, Wajad, I could have done food, right? You know, the Al Pastor taco comes from Lebanese immigrants and right. uh, Kushari in Egypt and Kichari in, in South Asia is basically the same food because of trade. Uh, I, I could have done food. I could have done hip hop. We, we could have done any number of these things. Um, and Urdu for me was not a first choice. It, it, it wasn't an instinctive choice, I should say. It's a learned language for me, mm. right? It's my, my fifth or sixth language. I could have done this for Swahili as well, which, which offers some of the same elements. And I'm saying we could have done this for all these things because I think it's important to say, yes, we could have done everything you said because we're looking at Urdu as an example of the flows of human culture. And so we could have done everything you said, because these are all examples of the flows of human culture. I think I settled on Urdu for two reasons. One, Mir, um, when I was learning Urdu, Mir was one of my, I, still my favorite 
classic Urdu poet. Contemporary Urdu poet is a poet by the name of Sahir Ludhianavi. Uh, but but Mir is my my sort of favorite classic, and I I propose this to Zeba, and uh, Zeba is an Urdu wali. This is you know uh, uh, her culture, her language. Uh, and and she jumped at it. She said, "Okay, what do you want to do? Write write what you want to do, and let's see." And I remember sending her the draft, you know, the, for just the first couple of pages of what I was thinking. And I said, "This is going to go one of two ways. Zeb is going to pick me up and in a very polite way say, this is very nice. I think we should go in a different direction.' She does. She or, does have a great tendency of killing you very politely, very politely, right? Or it would come back." like a goat on Eve, you know, would just be covered in red. Uh, and uh, uh, I got neither. Uh, I, you know, Zeba's response was was very supportive and, and said, uh, you know, Zeba, I don't remember exactly what she said, but you told me you shared it with your father, who is a, a scholar of Urdu, who said he liked it. And you said that was good enough. And something to that effect. <laughs> and so, yeah. but I, I'll leave it to you for that. And, and Zeba, as an Urdu Vali, and, you know, my first language is also Urdu, born and raised in America. Uh, for those who don't know, can you just give an introduction to Urdu, right? A cliff note to, to this beautiful language. So, very briefly, Urdu came into being when the soldiers in the Mughal dynasty's army, who was mercenaries, uh, came from the Arabian Peninsula speaking Arabic, the Persians speaking Farsi, the Turks speaking Turkish, and then the Indians speaking Hindi. So they started, they had this desperate need to communicate. And in that process, they came, they brought the ch from Turkish and p from Farsi and had the Arabic base with the Hindi sprinkled in and bit by bit they cobbled together a common language. So it was out of this urgent need to communicate, to connect with each other mm. because they were in this big fight together. And then uh, Urdu became eventually a really formal, codified and rich language and from it sprung a culture because there's the lingual part but then the other part with all these different cultures coming together, uh, the cross-pollination of ideas, not just in a fighting army, but in creative expression. That's after all um, what embodies the Taj Mahal and really sets it uh, apart as a unique example of beauty. It has all those cultural elements in it and it's iconic for its beauty. And that's, I would say, uh, Urdu's essence. It has become an icon for a plurality of cultures, of expansive thinking, and a layering. You know, as we say in Urdu, teh pe teh, yeah. layer upon layer. And that's how, by the way, our pulaos are made, as you know, our world famous pulaos or pilafs um, in different parts of the world. They're, they're called pilafs. And so that is the. Uh, compelling uh, aspect of Urdu. It, it was derived from a dire need, and then it grew into this astonishingly rich and diverse cultural expression. You know, this, the layering, the syncreticism, the pluralism, you know, uh, a food analogy would be a booyah base, and oftentimes it reminds me of the analogy that people use with the United States of America, a, a multiracial democracy and an ongoing experiment with so many different languages and cultures kind of thrown in, and yet we're trying still to forge an American identity. And I, and I mentioned that, and I appreciate that metaphor that you use, uh, especially how Urdu came out, right? It came out from like this, this pot, this mixed pot, which then evolved into something refined and even poetic and beautiful, like seen as it came from low culture and oftentimes now is seen as, oh, high culture, Urdu. Mm -hmm. But the, the beginnings were this uh, mongrelized creation of different cultures kind of coming together, just trying to survive. And, and, and some would say that's the United States of America, and specifically about America in this book called Are the Arts Essential? The, the title of the essay that you and Hussein wrote is An Urdu of the 21st Century of the United States. And I want to quote you, and also as proof that I did my homework. You both write, we must all learn to speak an Urdu. 
where all our words matter and create a system in which our pride as a nation is not in our armies, but in our schools. And so I'm sitting here thinking, why Urdu, especially in 2022 America? idea of pure cultures. And there's no such thing as a pure culture. Um, this mongrelization, the survival of communities, I think it's, you know, I, I would argue it's even one step more base is how do we talk to one another, right? Urdu becomes a way of how do we learn to talk to one another. So Urdu becomes this symbol of the ways in which we need to learn how to talk to one another, hear each other's language. So it's not just the literal, you know, Chirag and Dia and Lamp all meaning the same thing, right? And depending where you are and what it is you mean. Uh, but, but also thinking about the layers and also thinking about the creative ruptures. It's, it's not just the food. It's the dance, whether you think about Kathak or you think about Kowali, this South Asian devotional music. It's this way, these are ways in which people are communicating with each other, just not, not just literally in terms of language, but through their culture and through their cultural creation. Mm. And I think when we wrote that line that you're quoting is, what is the Urdu of the United States of America? We're obviously not expecting people to speak Urdu or to speak Swahili, but what is that Urdu of the United States that allows us to speak to each other using languages, using a common language that we're creating together rather than that's being imposed on us, that allows us space to say, these are our differences while still belonging to the United States and, and defining, every generation has to define what the United States is moving forward. And I think our key argument is, is that the only way you do that is when you're confident in who you are. And the only way you can be confident in who you are is when you invest in yourselves as a nation in terms of education. And I think language is a really interesting marker because if you're a certain class and you speak more than one language, it's considered fancy. But mm -hmm. if you're another class and you speak more than one language, it's considered ignorant. And to be sort of middle class is to be monolingual, right? And that's sort of normal in this country. And I think to myself, no place in the world is it normal to be monolingual. Of course, the title of the, the book, again, is Are the Arts Essential? With that being in mind, why should society, why should parents, why should communities already afflicted with so many challenges invest in the arts and culture, especially when people need infrastructure and food and housing, right? Can't they do without these pretentious, self-absorbed writers and geeks and nerds like Hussein? Give me another STEM graduate. What, what would you be your response, Eva? Well, I would say one, uh, a couple of things. The first is, and thank you for playing the provocateur. This is great. Um, one thing that Urdu did and what we through the Building Bridges program believe in is, well, Urdu collapsed the distance between those people in um, the Mughal army, right? It mm -hmm. served to collapse the distance. And the other thing it did, because it, they were forging something new together, because of their, their yearning for connection and for community. Um, and the other thing it did is they learned together. They learned mm. a common way to communicate together. So having that learning mindset always, always learning, always um, wishing to evolve and grow is one lesson I take from the development of Urdu uh, and those uh, early Urdu speakers or forgers of Urdu. And the second is this, in this collapsing of distance, it's in this um, unity. There is, I see in Urdu, a unifying force. I see this in the work that our grantees do as well. I see this in the arts as well. The arts are a means for expanding our thinking, for thinking horizontally and upside down and inside out. And that gives our imaginations, our brains, our whole being, uh, the ability to be nimble, Mm. And in that nimbleness to be resilient. So, of course, STEM is important. It's very important. That's one pillar of learning. 
The other part is exercising our imagination and feeling comfortable in doing that. And the play in arts allows that capacity to grow and to be woven into every single person's unique set of qualities. You know, if you look at the trends, anytime an authoritarian or a fascist regime comes in power, usually the first group that they kill or suppress are the thinkers, the writers, the artists, and the cultural workers. And so you have, in particular right now, this privileged space with the Doris Duke Foundation, and you know this space very well. The follow-up question I have is, how can we protect our cultural workers and cultural institutions in America, which are actively under assault? Uh, thank you for asking that important and very big question. Um, First of all, because it's our moral imperative to do so. Because I believe that building on what Hussein said and the questions that you're asking, that our superpower, mm. our superpower is in our independent thinking, in our unique imaginings of what could be, and in the inquiry that we allow ourselves because we have that kind of flexible thinking and freedom to roam, mentally freedom to roam, uh, and uh, do so with the confidence that we can. So this is one thing that, that the discipline really supports. I think this is why it's important to support institutions mm -hmm. that um, have within their framework built in um, arts education and humanities. And it's an essential pillar of um, our well being and of our community's well being to have this kind of thinking amongst us. It truly is each individual person's superpower to be able to imagine. You know, uh, as we synergize, and I'll practice what I preach. Uh, all these ideas uh, and thoughts uh, coming together, you know, there might be people who are listening right now who are like, I, I wish I was a cultural worker, but, you know, I became an engineer. Uh, I believe the arts are essential. Or they might read your essay and they might pick up the book and say, you know, even though I'm not a cultural worker or an artist, uh, you know, how can I, how can I, well, how is this practical to me, right? Like, uh, how is this essay practical to me? And so, I want to I want to give you guys a pitch. Here's a pitch opportunity. Someone picks up the book and they're not in the cultural space, but suppose they're intrigued. What is something that they can learn or take away from your particular essay in the book and apply it to their other areas of life? And and, and you know, broad stereotype here. Uh, you know, suppose someone's like a, uh, an engineer, an engineer who feels like he goes to work for a big corporation. You know, is a fan of pop culture, but is not a cultural worker. And his wife says, read this essay. He goes, all right. And, he, and he's like, what's in it for me? You know, Wajahat, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer the question after I challenge the premise of the question. And I is, want you to challenge the question and the stereotype right. in the question. So, yeah, there's a stereotype in the question, right? Which is, I think engineers contribute to culture as well, right? I mean, maybe not cultural worker in the way we generally think of it, which is the artist, the creative. But engineering is creative work, broadly speaking. It has a societal and social impact. I think what the value, and I think the book overall is an invitation for any reader, right? Are the arts essential? And you're, you're saying the title like it's a question. Are the arts essential? And, and what's the answer to that? But when I hear the title, it's sort of like, you know, when I was a little kid and I'd come, uh, my mom would come home from work and be like, did you make that mess? You know the answer. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a rhetorical question. Uh, of course, the arts are essential. Uh, I think the question is, you know, the arts are essential. What this book is trying to do through its various essays is really show different types of people how the arts are essential to them in different ways. Mm. I mean, there's so many great essays in here. But I'll say specifically with the content of our essay is that if you get that engineer who reads our essay and says, oh, yeah, is what I'm engineering is that inviting people to speak to each other? Is it making people's worldviews comprehensible to one another? Is what I'm doing being inclusive or inviting? Then the essay is a success. 
I don't know how to do that. You know, if you're a software engineer, I don't know how to do that as a software engineer. You know, that's your creative work. But if we planted that idea in your head, then the essay is a success from my perspective. And I think all the essays really do that type of work uh, for people who are not necessarily in this space. I myself am not personally a creative. I work with a lot with creatives. I think it's also the volume is also an invitation for people to look around and say, everywhere I'm looking is human creation, right? Is human artistic architecture, city design, urban layout, uh, the way my car is designed, the way the subway or the, the underground of my city works. Uh, and, and the food, you raise it, the food that I eat, the music I listened to when the pandemic began, all these streaming services had increased revenue and everybody's like, are the arts essential? Well, the first place everybody went to was streaming, was to watch movies and television. That's all art, right? And so to think about that in deeper and new ways, I think is the invitation. Zeba? I have to agree with everything Hussein said. Um, and I would add that picking up on his point about the pandemic and, and what we did is that so much of our time was spent in binge watching uh, artistic creations on all the streaming services or listening to music or uh, reading uh, whatever we wanted to read. These are all creative disciplines, literature or, uh, you know, the media um, and uh, also, of course, music. And then we created, of course, our own dramas, right? Uh, even in lockdowns, I would add that, uh, that we have the capacity for drama and we create it. Uh, but I think that what it comes down to is that our souls yearn for creativity. That's embedded in us. Um, Hussein uh, studied evolutionary biology. I would say that that's one of the, the points. I had a conversation with, um, a geneticist and I asked him what the difference was between us and say the other species and he said consciousness mm. consciousness is something that we know we have and that awareness and building on that awareness and harnessing it to our own best advantage is again going back to popular culture a superpower I know that even creating art even if it's writing an essay, can change the cultural worker themselves. Uh, you emerge sometimes a different person, hopefully a better person. And so the last question I have is for both of you, what's been your personal takeaway from your essay? And Zeba, you go first, because after all, Zeba has to go first. She's the Wonder Woman. <laughs> well, I would say uh, what I took away from this process of uh, writing with Hussein, and I've never done this before, uh, doing, uh, never co-written an essay with anybody. This is my first time. But it gave me the chance and it made me very excited to hear Hussein's ideas and read his ideas and see where he took, took it. And I was so surprised when I saw his uh, uh, work come over, his writing come over in my inbox. And I was like, wow, that's where he took it. And then that sparked another idea in me. And I remembered um, an Urdu Sher, actually, that was a favorite of my mother's and is a favorite of my father's and could be uh, attributed possibly to Mir Taqimir. Uh, and I'll say it in Urdu and then I'll do a rough translation. And here it goes. Is jahan khair, aram ka, rahat ka, baat tu jab hai, apni dunya, and translated it roughly, uh, roughly is in this difficult world, this fraught world, there is no peace, there is no serenity. The point is for you to create your own world out of this world. Mm. And that's it. And that's, I think, what I took away. Hussein brought his his words danced into my inbox i read them and i just grabbed that inspiration and created 
my own writing from that. And then we faded ideas back and forth and it was such a pleasure. And from there, mm -hmm. we developed this essay and it became a whole, there were two people writing. We collapsed the dis distance with our ideas and with our writing. And then together, we brought it to the point where we could send it to the publisher. Hussein, you have a tough act to follow. I expect Urdu and Swahili. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, not high note. Gonna, I'm not even going to pretend. I think uh, uh, Zeba's done our, our Urdu bait for the, for the conversation, uh, or the couplet for the conversation. Uh, I think I'll just pick up from where Zeba left off which is what did I learn from this essay in the writing process? Not necessarily from the content. Uh, we put in the content that what we wanted other people to get from it. But I think working with people with a different uh, worldview or, or complementary worldviews, right, uh, is, is really important to, you know, this essay was really practicing what we preach. I'm very invested in the theory of the humanities, in theories of social change, and how do we use the arts to tell stories. Zeba is very much in the world of how do we enable those creators, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think you see that in our essay, is the play between the 10,000 foot level and the 10 foot level, right? Like really seeing everything as, as a whole and then looking at very particular projects, how they're achieving this goal. And I think that that was the learning for me is that theory and practice are not separate. People have different skill sets and it's important to recognize those skill sets, but it was really, this essay was really for me. And I think for Zeba as well, Zeba, if I may speak for you, was really trying to practice what we were preaching in this essay is how do we talk to one another mm. in ways that are comprehensible to create something that is more generative and more interesting and more accessible and more public. Uh, and I, I think our essay did that. Uh, I hope our essay did that. Yes, I, want I to just want both... to... Go I ahead, Seba. To... You're the Sorry boss. Sorry to step on your words, but I want to... I'm inspired by what Hussein just said, that I think that this uh, writing conversation between the two of us really is uh, that call and response. Hussein um, put out a call and I, I responded in my writing. So it's very much like the Qawwali Sufi tradition, like the gospel tradition here in, in America, in the US, I should say, um, and in jazz and so many other disciplines. Um, and also the game that children play in throughout the Muslim regions, which is called Bet Bazi um, or, or Antakshri. And uh, that's, reciting competing teams recite verses to each other one puts out a verse and the other team has to grab the last letter of that verse and recite another verse uh, and it, in response so that call and response nature of our essay is embedded in it and that is going back to that word we've used a lot, the superpower of the arts, and that's why the arts are essential and why people should really read this book with so many brilliant essays um, by thinkers and academics and artists and cultural practitioners. Well, that's art, right? It's always done in relationship with the other. There's a call and response. The cultural worker creates the art. In this particular case, you create the essay, you write the essay, you you, like a child, you put it out into the world, and then the world will respond. Uh, and I hope that people do read the, the essay. I hope people pick up the book. The book, again, is Are the Arts Essential? A collection of 25 essays. One of those essays is by our very own Zeba Rahman and Hussein Rashid. That essay is called In Urdu of the 21st Century of the United States. I want to thank you all. Uh, for joining me. Thank you all for having this conversation. Uh, I could have spoken to you for 30 more minutes, but I shamelessly took my privilege as moderator and went, I think, probably 15 minutes even beyond my time. Uh, and speaking about call and response, for those of you who are watching this video, we did the call. You respond. Tell us how you feel in the comment section. Uh, reach out uh, to Hussein, reach out to Zeba, reach out to the artists and writers in the book. But first and foremost, of course, please purchase the book and do what you can 
to be creative, to be artistic, support your local writers, support your local artists. And the final thing I'll say is sometimes all a person needs to pick up the pen and tell their story is a little bit of encouragement. Just one person in their life to say, you know what? You have a story and I want to listen to it. So if you're in that position to give that type of encouragement, you can change someone's life. And as we have seen the power of stories, you might be able to change the future and direction of this country we call America. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.